Proverbs chapter 31. I'm veering off of Colossians today for a second. Uh, I know Mr. Mr. J. Wilson. He doesn't, he doesn't veer off for these kind of things. I got to be different than him in a one or two ways, right? So this morning I'm gonna I'm gonna actually hit a message on Mother's Day. Well, we'll see how it goes here. All right, Proverbs chapter 31, verse 28. Her children rise up and bless her. Her husband also, and he praises her. I'm just going to leave it there. Let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do praise your great and glorious name. We are truly thankful, Lord, that your, your scriptures, within them, Father, and, and particularly in, in reference to what you've done for us through Jesus Christ, but that we have everything pertaining to life and godliness. Lord, you teach us everything that we need to know for our hearts to be properly aligned, our, our minds to be focused and set on things above, for our character to be transformed into your likeness. Lord, we're thankful for the teaching that you give us Concerning how to do the things that the responsibilities that are on our plate here. That we would be, Father, a light to the Gentiles. Ask that you be with me today as I preach your word, that I would communicate it clearly, and that it would be in accordance with the truth. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, one one of the things that I for basically ever since I became an adult man, something that's been on my mind. Where are the dads? Where are the dads? It's been a problem in our culture in the United States for a long time. Non-existent fathers. Either completely missing in action or there but absent. It's a fair question. And the scripture would, one of the things that the scripture would Teach us and help us and exhort us, act like men. Be strong. Dads are important. But you know, a little more recent question that's coming to my mind is where are the moms? Where where are the moms? Moms are important. The foundational, fundamental, emotional hub of the family. Really set the tone of the family. And we're seeing more and more moms completely abandon their children. Which goes against everything that's hardwired into a woman. But the culture is such. And more than ever, we're seeing women who are... There but absent. On Facebook, but not helping their kids get their faces into books. The moms are important in you know the the idea. You know, I think about the, the pioneer woman and the toughness. You know, one thing that Terry O'Connell said to me after Gladys Memorial Service is, you know, he said. She did all that stuff before they knew that there was such a thing as adrenal fatigue. I thought, you know, there's, there's some truth to that. You know, we, as a culture, are with an emphasis on mental health. And I think mental health is extremely important. Scripture talks a lot about it. Matter of fact, Scripture's the only way you're ever going to get mental health. And I think being able to talk about things is super important I'll, you know, we'll, we'll see some of that today. But there are a lot of things in our culture that are designed as escape route ex- built-in excuses that give you a, every reason that you might be looking for not to be who God made you to be. God wants us to, to be who he made us to be. So today, this message is mostly positive. It is a godly mother. Incredible thing. Her children rise up. And bless her. Her husband also. And he praises her. This is, this is what God wants. So main points I just want to 
hit quickly today. Mom's in the Bible. Some qualities of a godly mother. I certainly don't have them even close to all listed. And then the church. Some spiritual application. The church is our mother. If I say this, the hand that rocks the cradle. Can you finish this for me? Is the hand that rules the world, right? That's... The most influential being, the face of the earth, the hand that rocks the cradle. What, what a mom instills into her children that changed the course of history. I'm actually going to read this poem. Okay, this, is, this is the line that we know, but this poem by William Ross Wallace. Blessings on the hand of women, angels guard its strength and grace. In the palace, cottage, hovel, oh, no matter where the place. Would that never storms assailed it, rainbows ever gently curled. For the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. Infant sees the tender fountain, power may with beauty flow. Mothers first to guide the streamlets, from them souls unresting grow. Grow on for the good or evil. Sunshine streamed or evil hurled, for the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. Woman, how divine your mission, here upon our natal sod. Keep, O oh, keep the young heart open, always to the breath of God. All true trophies of the ages are from mother love impearled, for the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. Blessings on the hand of women, fathers, sons, and daughters cry, and the sacred song is mingled with the worship in the sky. Mingles where no tempest darkens, rainbows evermore are hurled, for the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. A lot of good stuff in that poem, I think. A lot of truths. Uh, bottom line, mom's super, super important. I mothers in the Bible, I picked an interesting, cheesy picture just for the fun of it. Keep it light around here. You know, you guys, you guys tell me, men, Sarah. Who was Sarah the mother of? Isaac. We know she was the, the grandmother of Jacob whose name was changed to Israel. Did Sarah change the course of history at all? We think about Abraham as the father of the faithful, right? But isn't Sarah also upheld with her faith believing in that which God had promised? She considered God faithful. In what he had promised to her. Jochebed. Whose mom is Jochebed? Moses. She changed the course of history at all? I, I mean, the scripture says that his parents, Moses' parents, saw that he was a beautiful child. I'm just going to be real frank for a second. I remember, I'm sorry, Matthew, I love you. And I think you're a handsome fella. But I got some pictures of Matthew. His first, you know, the first time you go back in those days, you went and you had somebody take a picture. He's a few months old. And he's sitting there. And I mean, evolution's a bunch of baloney. But they have fun trying to show the stages of the kid. Yeah, Matthew's an interesting looking creature at a few months old. Let's just put it that way, Okay. So from, a, from, you know, oh, so cute. There's something cute about them, but I wouldn't say that they're beautiful physical creatures. But what, what did Jochebed see? She knew this child was beautiful. She was not about to have an abortion. I mean, to let those Egyptians kill that kid. Amazing, actually. Kept him quiet, hidden as long as he could, and then trusting God puts him out there in that wicker basket. And, you know, you can see her, you know, reading in between the lines, just praying, God, you're going to help me in this. You're going to work with me on this. Grows up to become the son of Pharaoh's daughter. But just so the way it worked out, which is a little bit of planning and her preparation on her part, too, to actually set some things up where she would get to be 
the nurse for this child. The formative years Jochebed spent with Moses, and you can see what he got in those formative years from a spiritual perspective. Those early years, moms, super, super, super important. How about Rahab? It's one you got to think a little bit and to quote your genealogy, right? Boaz, mother. I, I like Rahab. This lady has been a prostitute. Rough past. What the world would consider a sinner. Even the world would acknowledge that. This lady believed God. Some of the stuff that came about or that was brought up in class this morning, the things that God had done, they, those things got this lady's attention. And she knew that the one true living God was the God of the Israelites. And she was willing to lay down her, risk her own life to protect the spies of God's people. And God rewarded her. And she's in the genealogy from which Jesus comes. I like that. It does not matter your past at all. God can take you and use you and help you be an important woman in history for his glory. Ruth, right in there, the mother of, of Obed, right? And I just recently got to finish reading through Ruth. Man, what a great woman of faith. The opportunity, you know, her mother-in-law Naomi tells her, you guys go back, go back, go back. And Ruth's like, I'm going with you. She's clinging to her. My people be your people. Or your people be my people. Your God, my God. And you see this woman of character throughout that book and where God ends up blessing her tremendously. Gonna be, like, what's said at the end of that book you know, is fulfilled. David, shortly thereafter, her generation, and then Jesus. How about Hannah? Recently started 1 Samuel in my Bible reading. What a great woman. Woman of prayer. Man, you, you read the prayers of Hannah, and I'll just throw Mary in also. And my, my prayer life could pick it up a little bit. This lady pleading with God. And God answers her prayer and she is willing to take her son that she wanted so bad and to offer him to the Lord and trust him that God's going to do with him what he will. And Samuel, we know the results. How about John the Immerser's mom? God does pick carefully. Blameless. Scripture says blameless in her ways. Mary, mother of Jesus. Again, a great woman of prayer. The scripture calls her favored one. You know, some you probably can hear, hail favored one, the angel says to her. But it tells you a little bit later who she favored by. Favored by God. Okay? Great woman of character. How about Eunice? Looks to me like, who, who was she a mother of? Timothy, right? You know, the, it looks to me like she's, uh, her husband's a non-believer. We know he's Greek, and just the, what I'm piecing together there. And yet, Paul credits the faith of Timothy largely to his mom and to his grandma. Tremendous, tremendous impact on some of the greatest men of the Bible came because of their moms. Just real quick, this verse. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. I just want you to think with me. I've mentioned this before, but both male and female, we are created in the image of God. Now, 
I want to be clear about this. The scripture is clear. God is our heavenly father. Mr. J. Wilson was talking from Hebrews chapter 12 today. And the discipline of a father. And I've thought oftentimes about uh, Hebrews chapter 12 and the, the section on discipline. And God is not your heavenly grandfather. And God is not your heavenly mother. God's your heavenly father. In terms of discipline, I think we can all relate a little bit to what that means. But I do want you to notice something here. Both male and female created the image of God. God is spirit. Now there's some obvious physical differences between male and female, even though the world's trying to blur those in the weirdest ways possible. Obvious physical differences. But there's also some... When, when God made us in his image, male and female who created them, there's some differences in us inside, I'll just say at the soul level or at the spirit level, and both of us reflect the image of God. Not just physical differences. Both, again, this is a key point, male and female reflect God's character. Here's another funny picture I figured I'd put up there. Elaine is the only one that knew this one was going up, but... Oh, what a cute bunch of kids. Cuter than they're, they're a few months old, give them that. You know, there's some, there's some natural differences. I've talked about this before, but, you know, boys. Boys naturally rough and tumble. I've, I mentioned this, you know, that my boys, when it was time to, to go to bed at night as they got a little bit older, I'd give them an option. I'd say, you guys want a punch or a hug? They almost always wanted a punch. Now, we're, you know, we're not talking like, but we're, you know, just a look, nice old thump to the chest. They almost always picked that. Every once in a while, they said both. I don't, I don't think they ever picked just a hug. So like, oh, I'll take both, a punch and a hug. Hey, that's the way boys are. Hey, a little bit rough and tough and tumble. You know, my, my girls, a little more lovey-dovey. I remember my girls at the time, they were, their basic thing was, Dad, do you notice me? How do I look today, Dad? Do you notice me? And they would, I remember sometimes, and hopefully some of you guys can relate, they're trying to talk to me, and they would actually literally take my face and turn it towards them so that they knew. Okay? I remember little Talia, when she was younger, I had a little bit of hair back then. And I, one of my favorite things, she'd hop up on my lap, she'd bring a little comb, and she'd just comb out my hair. Okay? She couldn't do that now if she wanted to. Okay? But... Yeah, you know, that's girls. Okay. Elena twirling in her dress. Now, I do have to admit, okay, being two older brothers, there were times that they heard the scripture, act like men, be strong. I remember Elena trying to jump onto the pile sometimes when we were wrestling. And I did tell her, hey, you know, boys wrestle, girls give hugs. I remember her one day out on the front lawn. <laughs> I'm like, Okay, yeah, so, so this is a little bit general and a little bit coaching sometimes, all right? But, but there are some natural inherent differences. Love you, Elena. Ah. You know what, 9-11, it's interesting, 99% of the rescuers who went into the building were men. There's a primary reason for that. God actually wired us differently. Men have an ability to compartmentalize much, much more naturally than women. I'm, I'm going to die. I don't care. Okay. Get out of there, whoever needs. But you know, guess where the women are? They're outside taking care of those and protecting those who are alive. That one's pretty important too, isn't it? Equally important. Differences. I'm thankful for that. Women, by nature, are more gentle and protecting. And there's a purpose that God has for that. Some qualities. Now, this is some. And as a disclaimer, 
I will say that my knowledge about these, other than from what's revealed in the scriptures, is, is going to be taken, many of these I'm taking from my mom and from my wife, what I've seen from her over the years. So, but I think these are, these are some important things that, ladies, I, I do, I commend you. And I also want to encourage and exhort you to be the moms that God wants you to be. First and foremost, qualities of a godly mother is an eternal perspective. In other words, your greatest mission is to help do everything in your power to help your kids make it to heaven. Whether they were named homecoming king or queen, who cares? Whether they were the MVP of their sports league or not, who cares? Whether they were straight 4.0 students or not, who cares? Now, might be a little bit of some discipline stuff that is, comes into play in what the big goal is. But you, you remember what matters is that your children make it to heaven. Women should be saved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. Moms, your number one goal in life as a mom is to make disciples of your children. That eternal perspective. Gentle touch and comfort. That's why I, I know you guys have heard me talk about this, but my mom, one thing I love about she had gentle touch. I like that. I remember her nails going up and down my arms. Scott, you're nodding. You remember that? Oh, yeah. Okay. You know, but blessed are the gentle. Isn't that what the scripture says? There's something really comforting about the gentle touch of a mom. My mom's hugs were just a little softer in more ways than one than my dad's. Okay. Some of you guys give Mr. J. Wilson a hug, and it's a pretty solid oak tree. Okay. My mom's soft, gentle. Okay. You know, it's nice to have that touch. Moms, instilling a desire in your children to do right, to please God. You know, I, I think about Moses, and somehow... In those early formative years, his mom must have instilled in him a desire to do right because it bothered him when he saw his brethren being mistreated. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, man, this is something that's missing in our culture. And moms, you in those formative years so much set the tone for that. Your kids wanting to do what's right. I actually love, love teaching the, the younger kids in school and you moms are doing a great job. I'll just say that. I, I see the sentences your kids write, the stuff they talk about, the stuff they mark on the marker board. It's so oftentimes about pleasing God. It's just really, really encouraging. I love that. Those seeds that you're putting in there, so important. I know my mom, something she always, a number of things she did for me, but one of the things is, Trying to instill in me a desire to please God. Fruit of the Spirit. A particular one for me that I think of is self-control. We'll get to that in a second. But you know, it's important things in, in being a parent. And of course, love, I think, encompasses true scriptural love. But sometimes I think as parents... We can think if we just example, model this, right? And, but just being the example to your kids, I don't think is enough. And, and let me explain what I mean by that. Your kid can view your sacrifice for them as them being the center of the universe. So you're modeling for them what sacrifice looks like day in, day out. And moms are amazing sacrificers. But if you don't teach your kids, so when I say this model and teach, teach them to do the same. 
So it's, it's an important part. My mom, I remember self-control was the big one. She, for some reason, she thought she needed to work overtime with me on that. Some of you that knew me know why, but she would self-control. I can still sing the self-control is, is just controlling yourself. Listening to your heart and doing what is smart, right? Never liked to brush my teeth. I wish that I could stop. Had more time for candy bars and drinking soda pop. Soon my teeth would hurt so bad from all those cavities. Oh, me. And she'd pull out her false teeth. Okay, that's what's going to happen to, you know, self-control. Self-control. Self-control, Luke. She knew I was ticklish. She'd like to come right up and never quite touch me. I'd start like self-control, self-control. Always work at that fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Okay, to model and teach. And again, I want to want to say, commend what I see you moms doing in this congregation. This is important. This is what your kids want, the fruit of the Spirit. This is what you want them to have, the qualities. So model and teach it. Discipline, important part of training. Yeah, there's discipline a lot of times that is left to the father. I remember a few times that uh, my mom left notes on the fridge from when my dad got home. That was not exactly a restful night. Okay? A couple times he woke up, woke up, dad got home. I'm going to deal with this tonight. Okay? Doesn't like that very much. But there were also plenty of times my mom had to deal with stuff on the spot. I remember the Hot Wheels tracks. You guys got Hot Wheels tracks? Hey, those babies burn. Okay? What I'm, the discipline's important. And in our culture, you know, I... God, I'll just say this. God's not an advocate of child abuse. Okay? I, I kind of hate that I have to preface it always with that, but in our culture, I have to. God's not an advocate of child abuse. And I will say, you look at child abuse where it happens, it almost always happens because parents don't discipline their children consistently, and their kids are just little terrors, and they push parents over the edge so their parents snap. I, I dealt with a lot of these things. That's usually where it comes from. Good, consistent discipline is an important part of training. And moms, you got to be willing to. This, sometimes this goes against the loving, gentle, comforting nature of moms, but you better do it. Your kid's soul's on the line. You want to be going at it toe-to-toe -to -toe with your teenage son or daughter all the time, every day, then you... Better discipline when they're young. It's not always about them getting their way. Oh. In our family, we had strong-willed, I won't say who, and they, I'm going to use weird pronouns for this, but they did know how to push and push and push and push and push and push and push Julie. Because she is more gentle and comforting than me. But I'll give Julie credit, she's tough. She's tough. She knew this is important. So I, I will just encourage you moms again. One of the things that gets in our way in our culture so much today is these dumb phones, smartphones, whatever they're called. They steal your time and attention away from the things that are important. Get off the couch and be a mom. Read to your kids. Get up and discipline them. Make them do what you tell them. You tell them to clean your room. Don't say, okay, clean the room. Go out there on your, on your couch and read, what, read your phone. Then you're so shocked they don't have their room clean. You got to get in there and do it with them. Right? You guys know how this goes. Get in. Okay, let's start working on this. Let's start working on this. This is what we got to do. Be moms. Discipline. It's hard to impose discipline or help raise up disciplined children if we're not disciplined ourselves. So important aspect of this. Food and other love languages. I say this from a guy perspective. Okay? It's a good way to get to a guy. Okay? Good food. And uh, my mom was a good cook. My wife's a good cook. Mm. And, uh, oh, the other love languages, right? You guys know what, what some of those are. So sacrifice, I guess what I'm going to say. Okay? Both my mom and my wife as a mom Family's first. I notice still, man, Julie will, will cook up a great dinner. If there's not quite enough, 
She, oh, I'm not, I'm not that hungry. Yeah, right. But it's everybody else first. And one thing I've noticed, Jerry talked about the Lord's Supper. Food has an amazing way of providing an opportunity for open communication. I've, I know I've said this before, but one of my favorite things at home, when my mom had chocolate chip cookies after school, I'd come home, mm, 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 and I lean up against that counter and I start eating chocolate chip cookies, and we could talk about anything. It's important. I could even talk to my mom about girls. That's a good thing, isn't it? I'll say this. My mom, she told the line of, of what was right, but I also could talk to my mom about where I was actually at and my real struggles, and I'll, I'll say it this way, without fear of judgment. It didn't mean she wasn't going to give me some guidance. It wasn't mean that she wasn't sometimes going to get on my case, but there was an environment where I could be honest and open with her about where I was at. That, how valuable is that? That's, that's something that's missing, again, in our culture big time. Oh, I got that. Quick to hear, slow to speak. Sometimes we think good communicators are good talkers. No, good communicators are good listeners. Moms are good listeners. Beautiful combination of truth and kindness. Kindness and truth that are bound around our neck, written on the tablets of our heart. This is, no, today I'm not, Colossians is preaching on how we do these things. Today I'm just, I'm, this, is, this is what it is, Christianity, truth and kindness together. That's tough, that's a tough combo, isn't it? Especially in our world where if you tell truth, people are kind of telling you you're a hater. If you stand on the truth and you treat people right, you're kind as you tell the truth, you speak the truth in love, moms. Great quality of a godly mom. And then my mom, I'll just say this for me. Absolute unwavering belief in me. I think back, I've always, I thought I was a good kid. And I think back to some of the stuff I pulled. And I was like, man, if my school kids ever did that. But my mom believed in me. No matter what mistakes, I mean, I, I think I told you guys this. I got confused. We... We'd take a bath, and we'd be getting out of the bath. Mom would be drying us off with little kids. She'd oh, you boys are so handsome. And I heard the word hands, and I'd look at my hands. They're all wrinkly. i think, I'm handsome. All right. But she told me over and over again how handsome I was. Okay. I don't know, Mom, how I look from up there. But, uh, you know, absolute unwavering belief. Whatever she can convince me, whatever I wanted to do in my life, I could do. This is important. Everybody needs somebody to believe in them. Moms, you are awesome at this. All right, let's apply this spiritually for all of us. The true Proverbs 31 woman, who's that talking about? It's a foreshadow, it's a picture, it's a prophecy, it's a description of the church. The church is the bride of Christ. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 26 talks about the Jerusalem above. Okay, we go through work, I'm not proving that today. But it's talking about the church. She is free. She is our mother. Whoops. That's not me. I don't know what's going on in the back, but that's all right. <clears throat> um, I see Nick Cover on it. So, um, Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother. Revelation chapter 12 paints a picture of the church. Thank you, sir. Um, and the church is pictured as a mother. Side note. What kind of... You can't, you can't be a mom unless you bear children. Rather than when the church is being who we're supposed to be being, a lot of these qualities that we talked about of godly mother, the church communicates these things. In a very real spiritual sense. And we bear children. If we don't bear children, we're not, we're not being a good mom. Just the common sense reality. I'll just leave that, leave that there. We, we bear children. 
Church is welcoming, gentle, and comforting. Actually, go with me for a second. First Thessalonians. Some of us have been Christians for a long time. And by God's grace, we've been able to develop some really good habits of righteousness. And, but, you know, people that are, are new Christians or in the process of becoming Christians, oftentimes pretty messed up. And, you know, what, what's the, the church mentality? Get all those external things fixed right away so you look good? Oh, the church is... We're willing to help be patient, be gentle, welcoming, comforting, and letting God get in and change a person's heart from the inside out. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I like the way Paul says this here. He says in verse 7, But we prove to be gentle among you, as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. Having thus a fond affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own, our own lives, because you had become very dear to us. You know, when a, when a kid's learning how to walk, you know, and mom's down there working with them, and, you know, helping them crawl, helping them learn to walk. That kid trips and falls, and mom's like, spanks on the behind, get up, do it again. No, Jim's like, what? That's not what a mom does. You can do it. You can do it, right? You know, pick you up, dust you off, give you a hug, and here we go again. Like, this is what people need. This is what new Christians need. People who are in the process of becoming Christians need. This is who the church is. The church believes in each other. Lord's Supper, we are unified. We are one. We see each other not according to the flesh anymore. We believe, yes, you can become like Jesus Christ. No matter what your past was, no matter what yesterday was, you picking him, you, you showing up today, ready to go, ready to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, we are with you, we believe in you, we believe in the power of God, and we believe in you. It's an amazing thing. We believe in God. Absolutely, 100%. But you know, I can't help but notice when I read this book, God believes in me. Church believes in each other. The church, the ultimate combination of kindness and truth. The reality of it is, culture we live in today is hard to take a stand for truth. Brethren, you can, we can't do this without truth. Actually, let's go to 2 John. Like, there, is, there does have to be a, a toughness here. 2 John. Chapter 1, I don't have time to... To read all these verses, I'm just going to jump to verse 4. But you'll see a combination of truth and love in in this chapter. But in verse 4, I was very glad to find some of your children walking in truth, just as we received commandment to do from the Father. If we don't stand in truth, if we don't teach our children to walk in truth, then to steal from Hebrews 12 today, we got illegitimate children. Absolute stand for truth with kindness on our lips the way that we live our lives. So, I've, I've said this before, but I'm going to say it again. My, one of my favorites. We were doing a Bible study in Forsyth, Montana. A bunch of guys with me, Jared Schaefer's contacts. We went there, drove there. A couple, actually two other guys with me. We got done with our study that night, and there was a, a couple different couples. And I said, hey, the church is, church is buying dinner tonight. So I'll go. So we get out to the car, and I look around at the guys and say, uh, by the way, guys, you're the church. <laughs> We're the church. Okay? And, and that's the truth, all right? I told them the church is buying dinner, but who's the church? Us. Here we go. It, the church does these things. Who is that? It's you and it's me. We are the church. Mothers, be great moms. I'm, I'm thankful, like I say, with how you're doing. Really, really appreciative of that. You don't compare yourself to the world. Come back to, yeah, this is who God made you to be as moms. In church, we are a spiritual mother. So all of us want to be adopting these qualities and implementing them in our lives for the sake of being who God made us as the church to be. 
Happy Mother's Day. Let's stand. I, I've got to say one other thing. Truth and kindness. Truth is informational. I'll say kindness is relational. And both of these are important. And we have a whole denominational world that wants to jump to the relational apart from the informational. You can't do that. That's not kindness at all. Love, love doesn't rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with truth, right? That being said, brother, we are tremendously blessed in this congregation. The information from the scriptures that is just every which way hammered away at us, and hopefully you're hammered away yourself, putting that in. That base got to be there. But there's also is the, the relational, the kindness, the sharing of your heart, of your own lives with other people. This is what it takes to make disciples. This is what it takes to help spiritual children grow. We want to do both. Absolutely both. That's who we are. That's who God's made us to be.